Do you remember Hypertech PCs? Well, me neither. In fact, there's basically nothing about them online. But either way, I thought it would be cool to clean up and use this Windows 95 computer that I got from Electronic Recycling Australia. They're one of South Australia's leading e-waste recyclers that assist and provide people with disabilities ongoing employment. So let's take a look at this really old computer. You might remember me going over this lot of old machines earlier this year. A whole lot of dirty old computers spanning from the 80s all the way up to the early 2000s. One of them being this Hypertech High Performance, a fairly boring looking machine that was assembled here in Australia by a company that only made computers for about a year. In early 1996, there was an announcement of Hypertech launching an Aussie PC, and the executives were adamant that the failure of Australia's market leading PC builder Osborne Computers was a problem with their management and not a reflection of the state of the PC market. The high performance family of computers was expected to have processors ranging from 75 to 120 megahertz, meaning my 133 megahertz model was definitely one of their last creations. And by August of 1996, they were reportedly undercutting the competition by up to $1,000 to try and lure in more home computer users. And an article from literally a year later states that Hypertech was slashing their workforce and getting out of PC sales. The model in my possession has an upgraded CD-ROM drive circa 2001, the LG 52x Max. And to be fair, there's a chance this machine didn't even come with an optical drive when new, and the absence of labels mentioning the function of the Ethernet and sound cards suggest that they may have been added at a later date as well. There is also a fairly baked in layer of dust with the silhouette of whatever 90s monitor sat on here, but that's nothing a bit of eucalyptus oil can't help with. I'll also try whitening up the front plastic later in the video as it's become pretty yellow. Inside this desktop has aged pretty well, just a bit of dust and no signs of rusting. It uses a pretty sought after Socket 7 motherboard that's paired with the 133 MHz Pentium processor cooled with a very small fan. Now the question on my mind is, does it still work since I powered it up at the start of the year? The answer is thankfully yes, detecting 49 megabytes of RAM and booting into Windows 95. There is some sort of error message for what I assume is the sound card, then it loads to the desktop without any sound. It is indeed detecting the sound card, which I know works as I borrowed it for another computer video I did recently. And since we've got some sunny weather in between the flooding, hail and downpours, I decided now is a good time to whiten the front plastic. It's held on with four screws, one in each corner, and I'll leave the floppy drive as it is so we get a good before and after comparison. After applying some spray and wipe, I gave the plastic a thorough blast with the garden hose. Next, I began applying 40 volt hydrogen peroxide with a brush. And after just 30 minutes, it was noticeably wider, so I kept applying more to keep the surface from drying out. And we'll come back to it a bit later to see the final result. The sound card wasn't the only device to have driver issues. The PCI Ethernet card was also at fault. And I was able to find something online that will hopefully get the card working. But to get those files and games onto the machine easily, I thought I would try it using this CF card to IDE adapter. Thankfully, I have a stack of old memory cards used in early DSLR cameras. This can be plugged directly into the spare IDE connector on the motherboard. Ideally, I would have preferred to plug this into an IDE cable, however, I don't have any male to female adapters. My first hurdle was setting the master and slave jumper pins correctly. Since I didn't want to boot off the CF card, I made sure to connect pins 2 and 3. The machine now detected both the hard disk and the CF card adapter, but it would just sit there and not boot. I also tried changing the jumper on the hard disk itself to see if that would make a difference. It now began asking for a boot disk. Perhaps it was trying to boot to the CF card instead. And to fix this, it required me to remove the jumper entirely, and it finally loaded into Windows 95 again. Success, it detected the 2GB CF card, which still had old Canon DSLR folder structure, but no pictures sadly. I then copied the sound and Ethernet drivers over using this laptop that you may recognize from a few older videos of mine. The next step was removing the old drivers using the provided uninstaller, and even after installing the new drivers, the sound still did not work sadly. It had been about two hours since I let the plastic whiten outside, and it was now noticeably whiter than before. The floppy drive was a originally as yellow as the rest of the front. It'll be interesting to see just how long it stays that way. Perhaps this system doesn't like the sound card in here for whatever reason. So I found another one I had lying around. I slotted in where the previous
this card was. I also had to remove the metal backing plate as it sat too high in the card slot. However, it didn't seem to work at all or even be detected anyway. I ended up putting the original card back in and installed the drivers once more. In the settings, it said that there was a resource conflict code 15. Perhaps the Ethernet card was at fault. And what do you know, after taking the Ethernet card out, the sound was finally working. So let's take it apart, give it a bit of a clean before I play some games on it at the end. I find it quite useful to make note of all the connectors and where the PCI cards plugged into the motherboard, which makes putting it back together far, far easier. And my best guess is someone bought this from the Australian Institute of Sports sometime around 2001, putting in a newer CD-ROM drive, but surprisingly they left the asset tag on there. And I highly doubt this machine has been used at all in the last 15 years since it's still running Windows 95. So it must have sat somewhere up until recently as it was thrown into a recycle bin then given to me. This is also one of those old machines that required you to manually shut down the computer when it was safe to do so. You've probably seen this message before. This is because the power button is a physical switch that connects directly to the power supply. This 200 watt Enlighten Corporation one seen here. And after removing three screws and releasing a few clips, the Socket 7 motherboard is finally out. It has some Hypertech branding, which I think means it was made in 1996. Several other components also have these stickers, and all the dust leads me to believe this saw a lot of use back when it was, well, used. And a light brushing got it looking a lot cleaner once again. But while most of the components are not actually made by Hypertech themselves, the RAM actually is. Humbly dubbed Hyper RAM. I then dusted out the rest of the computer. The capacitors in this ancient power supply look to be in good health as well, and I would strongly suggest not opening a PSU as dangerous voltages lie within, even if it hasn't been powered on in a while. The frame itself is pretty generic and probably not made by Hypertech themselves, but it has thankfully no signs of rust and some of the scuff marks on the plastic front did actually come off with some eucalyptus oil. Others were noticeably lighter, but still visible. And a system like this has definitely shot up in value in recent years. The motherboard alone could sell for more than $100. Now let's have some fun and use this incredibly rare 90s computer. Ah, that startup sound brings back so many good memories. So let's take a look at some of the software already on this computer. Here's one called Facetune, which lets you create whatever your heart desires. And if your heart desires that, well, it's time to get a heart transplant. Next up is Dweebs. I have no idea how to play this. I clicked on basically everything, but can't figure out what to do. There's also a game pack containing 40 games. Uh, nothing particularly interesting to me, at least. Now for some games I installed, starting off with Monster Truck Madness. It runs all right on here. The one megabyte graphics card is definitely limiting for 3D games. And a game that's required by law to test on old machines is Duke Nukem 3D. It's very capable of running it, even at VGA resolution. The original Age of Empires struggles quite a lot and isn't what I'd call playable. And this is a game that I only ever played the trial version of back on an old Celeron powered HP desktop many years ago. And how could I not test the psychedelic 3D Maze screensaver? I don't recall ever seeing the option to make the textures this hypnotic though. And there we have it, a true relic of the past and a rare piece of Australian computer history. Perhaps I'll have to try and find other hypertech devices in the future. There's honestly something so interesting about these old, unassuming beige towers, and I'm glad to have another one in my collection. Anyway, thank you very much for watching, and if you want to see more, definitely consider subscribing, and if you've liked this video, feel free to leave a like. I'll see you in the next video.